please go ahead. My question is for you. Uh, since you're an atheist and you don't believe in God, uh, your starting point is, you know, uh, matter, time, and chance. You know, matter when you look at the primordial soup, uh, soup, you know, blah 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 blah, or you know, time is just goo as it's moving right now. Uh, having said that, uh, since they're always changing, truth as a category can't exist because what is true today, as time, matter, and, and chance are changing, it, it can't be the same tomorrow. So, but you seem to believe in truth as a category does exist. Why do you say that? Because what's true right now is definitively true right now. It doesn't matter if it's not true tomorrow. It's true in that discrete measure, and therefore, in at least a metaphorical sense, truth exists. Whether it's whether you want to say that it's conceptually, we conceive of it. But when, when I when I conceded that point about truth, what I'm saying is that uh, it, it goes back to logical absolutes. Whatever this is, that's what it is, and it's not something else, and it's not neither or both. And it is that at, at an instantaneous moment that you can't really define. It's it's. Um, so I have no problem at all with the idea that something is true, or that there may be a metaphorical category, a way of thinking about truth in which it becomes that kind of category. Is, is do true. I look at do I look at the universe and say, ah, oh, there's physical, conceptual, and truth? No, not really. Not as an extant thing. Is truth enduring? Is there is there in a category of enduring truth? I don't know. Because if you follow that through then the only conclusion you can come to is that all truth is relative. No, I don't know how that's the only conclusion you can come to. A rock is a rock. A what rock other is conclusion is that? A rock is a rock irrespective of what anybody else thinks about it. And therefore, that is the truth that is not relative. The, you mentioned a couple times that atheism, materialism, um, disregards this notion that there is any objectivity that it all becomes subjective, and that's not remotely true. The, the, the endeavor of science is to describe and understand the objective natural world to the best of our ability. There's no denial that you know Saturn exists, um, and and that that same thing applies pretty much across the board. But but the questions of the, the truth of morality, on the existence of morality, is not a question of empirical science. It's a question of values. It's a question of presuppositions. Now, if no enduring no category of enduring truth exists then morality by definition, by necessity, has to be relative. It's, it may be the case that there are scientific truths to be learned about morality, which is in part the case that Sam Harris is making. And it's part of what I'm saying. That if you think about it, in any particular situation, there are a number of possible actions. And some of them are better and some of them are worse. Which means out of the pool, the finite pool of actions for this particular situation, there is a set, it may be a set of one, it may be a set of 50,000, that represent the pinnacle best moral action for that scenario. In that situation, that is objective. It is independent of each individual observer. But here's my problem with that. See, and I don't mean to be offensive, I really don't. Every time atheism tries to meld to meld morality with the system. I'm sorry I'm offensive. You're not gonna, some people are not going to like this. It always ends up in more blood. You've never seen it. What you've seen, what you've seen are ideologies that were consistent, or perhaps the enforced position of there will be no religion. That is an ideology. It is consistent with, but not caused by atheism. If you're going to talk about cause, you need something that's both necessary and, and sufficient. And atheism is neither necessary nor sufficient to the type of ideology that ends up in gulags. Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. See, the only, the only, the only, the only stand against the atheist program. I'm not saying all atheists are like this. Understand that. Well, then it's, it seems like nonsensical to say the atheist program because you're talking about something that doesn't exist. The, the, the grand ideologies of the last century have always been, been, been atheistic and therefore utopic in scope. Okay, And the only thing that stands against them is an appeal to transcendent morality. Wow. Totalitarianism, 
That's no question. I'm not saying all atheists are totalitarians. I'm saying totalitarianism is by necessity atheistic. And there is no there is no stand against that except an appeal to transcendent and enduring truth. Really quickly, two, in like five seconds. Even if it was necessarily atheistic, atheism is not sufficient. You need both to determine a cause. And it's intellectually dishonest to a certain cause, absent both of those. I'm not saying that atheists will become totalitarian. I'm not saying that. I'm not making a judgment. Hitler and Stalin both have mustaches. We're, now, now we're talking about correlation versus causation. The fact that something is correlated with something. Nazism and Marxism denies the transcendent character of the individual person. So do I. I know you do. I know you do. Well, That's why it's a fundamental question of our relationship. <laughs> so we have a side debate in addition to sidetrack this over. Uh, yes, please. Next question. Father Jacobson. Yeah. Uh, since you don't presuppose materialism, how do you tell the difference between something that's immaterial and something that's imaginary? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. Sometimes, sometimes with with um, with um, you know, well, I, I'm thinking. See. See, Im imaginary. I mean, there's a there's a pejorative. I, I hear what you're saying. There's a pejorative attached to it, but I think that human imagination is a, is is one of the tremendous gifts. I think I think one of the things that that um, and this needs to be developed in our theology, but in our anthropology. But one of the things that really shows that we are created in the image and likeness of God, I hold Genesis to be true. Not literal, not historical, but true. Is our natural aptitude for creativity of taking the stuff of creation, words, clay, whatever, and refashioning it into something that's larger than we are, and that speaks to a truth greater than the 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 arts possesses, right? So I see human imagination as 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 uh, critical. To, to, to human self-identity and, and, and also the, the awareness of man's own transcendence, okay? But that, that has to occur, and it, it will only occur if the notion that a transcendent truth exists because it calls man to reach outside of himself and to reach higher, okay? So something can be imaginary, okay? But still very true, the novel of Dostoevsky's, for example, all the characters are imaginary, they never lived. But they're truer than, than life, okay? So the answer to the question then, really, I can't answer it with a yes or no. The answer to your question is really tied in to your deeper notions of where truth lies and how to discover it. Part of the reason that our culture is so vulgarized these days is because the notion that transcendent truth is dimming, okay? And so what we have is we have pop culture that doesn't reach very deep, but it's very pervasive everywhere. But it's, it's simply not very good because it's not very deep. It's entertaining, but it's simply not very good. It doesn't tell us anything, okay? If it's deeper, and if it's, it's these things always, always learn and struggle. Okay, nothing, nothing in life, I'm old enough to know this now, nothing in life comes without some kind of suffering or some kind of conflict. It just doesn't. Okay? But, but to say something then, something is imaginary, is not necessarily to degrade it. Again, it needs a judgment. Is that product of the imagination pointing to something that's deeper, that's truer, that's elevating us? Or is it not? You make a judgment based on that criteria, and, and no other in my, in my view. Okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, next question, please. Okay, my question is one of clarification. I noticed that, um, Father, you spoke of the self-correcting me mechanism that Christianity has, and I don't know if you, I don't know if I misunderstood, but you spoke about the um, flaw in atheism being that it can only relate from its own personal experience. 
Um, and then, Mr. Delahunty, you spoke about um, the rational analysis of cause and effect um, and evaluating our decisions and then changing our beliefs as a result. So what I'm wondering is, what is this self-correcting mechanism and why is of what Mr. Dillahunty spoke of in terms of cause and effect not an appropriate self-correcting mechanism? And is personal experience, um, well, is the greater good not in line with some transcending personal experience? Because, because my presupposition is, is that morality is not quantifiable. It reaches into the deeper areas of human experience like creativity, like I just defined, okay? The self-correcting mechanism is this, is that a brave soul comes forward and says you're wrong, okay? And that's what happens. There's been times in Christianity when the majority of Christians were wrong about things, okay? And this is especially true, I can speak of Orthodox history, where people have even been persecuted by the church. The problem in church, church with the church, is whenever it gets too closely aligned to the state, it gets in trouble and it does things it should not do. Now you always have people who, who stand up and say no, wrong. Lots of times those, those people even get persecuted by the church, okay? But the next generation sees the rightness of their words and it self-corrects. So the self-correction occurs because of, um, number one, the individual bravery of, of lone prophets, so to speak. But these lone prophets, it's just like it's just like Martin Luther King. Okay? You know why he succeeded? Read his speeches. He was a lone prophet in, in American culture. You know why he succeeded? Because he called the deepest moral impulses from the people forward. And all his language, remember I said truth comes into the world through a word? All his his language drew so deeply from the moral Christian moral tradition that those who heard had their consciences awakened and they changed their moral outlook towards the black man. That's how it works. That's the self-correcting mechanism. Because if morality is referenced to to something beyond your individual experience, to an authority, to a category, whatever, higher than yourself, okay, then the appeal you bring forward, if true, rouses us the, the consciousness of people. Uh, we've seen that in the church, we've seen it with Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. 